So another issue that we need to address in reference to uh, workplace discrimination is the idea of tokenism. And this is, um, this can be seen in reference to race, ethnicity, um, uh, gender, as uh, things like affirmative action took place, um, hiring practices started to change, this idea of tokenism uh, really began to take shape, hiring people to meet a quota. Um, as I said, tokens are people who are admitted into an organization who are recognizably different from the large majority of the members of the organization. Men and women are treated very differently when this tokenism happens. So let's say you have a, an all-male workplace and a female is hired. That female can be constructed, can, that can be constructed as a token and um, this could, the, the way that social construction goes from males onto that one female could be very different than the way that would go if you had an all female workforce and, um, and a male was entering that workforce. So there's, there's some, some overall issues with tokenism. This idea of women and institutional barriers discussed before takes us to this idea that women are often treated as representative of their entire group when they're tokens. They're hyper visible as members of their category, but ultimately they're invisible as individuals, which makes it so it makes it difficult for these women to advance because they're already fulfilling a token position which there might be resentment within the group as it is because of that. And th then they're seen as being in, they're, they're, they're not seen. They, they become invisible as individuals. And therefore they have to work harder to have their achievements noticed. And it becomes very difficult for someone who is defined as a token to actually move up through the ranks. Men, on the other hand, seem to have a glass escalator when they're constructed as a token. Sometimes when men fall into these women's positions, they can be associated with the basic stereotypes of um, being effeminate or um, the work that they do is wimpy or asexual, feminine or passive. So they can be socially, socially instructed in a uh, relatively negative way. But often you see an invisible privilege for men within those groups. I talked about nurses earlier, predominantly women's profession. Um, but when a man does enter nursing, and you do have many of many men that are nurses being uh, socially constructed by males um, as being effeminate. But within the nursing profession itself, those men tend to gain advantage. They make about $9,000 more than the average female nurse, and they move up in the ranks into management quicker than females do. So regardless, women and minorities experience tokenism within the workplace and sometimes it's good for them and sometimes it's bad but for women tokenization means that the individual woman is rarely seen but is always seen as representative of the whole group as a result tokens often have to work twice as hard to validate the positions within their workplaces and when it comes to advancement it is often perceived as a disadvantage and it's the exact opposite for men this brings us to sexual harassment sexual harassment's a topic in the news media right now it pops up every now and again um, of course it was a defining characteristic of the 2016 election um, the 
candidate, Donald Trump, was uh, accused by multiple, multiple women of sexually harassing them. He was caught on tape making um, uh, prejudiced comments about women, how he treats women, how he can treat women because he's in power. And he was still elected. So you may have thought that, oh, well, it's okay to sexually harass women in the workplace these days. If the President of the United States can do it, why can't I? And so coming out of the 2016 election, um, I thought that might be the environment we were moving into. But uh, as you see with the um, accusations against Harvey Weinstein, his removal from his position, the Weinstein company is literally being disbanded. It's being sold. The Weinsteins will no longer be making movies, at least not with the company that they have had and the power they have possessed over the past 50, 70 years that the Weinsteins have been in Hollywood. So sexual harassment is real. It happens, happens often. And um, the, the laws have been codified in such a way that it can create some real, real problems for people in power if women or men who are being sexually harassed actually come out and make their claims public. So sexual harassment is one of the primary ways that men resist gender equality in the workplace. It's one of the ways we keep women in check. It was first officially recognized in the 1970s as the unlawful employment act or practice for an employer to discriminate against any individual with respect to compensation terms, conditions, or privileges of employment. And by 1982, it was seen as just as bad as racism in the workplace. So as the laws begin to change, the workplace environments are forced to change as well. And there are consequences to statements or uh, intimi uh, intimidating uh, practices against any group within the workplace. But generally speaking, it's the dominant men within the workplace that use sexual harassment to um, keep women in their place and keep men who don't fit into the uh, normal gender roles that that dominant group might adhere to. When it comes to sexual harassment, between 50 and 85% of working women will experience some for form of sexual harassment during their career. 50 to 85% of the women that go into the workforce will experience sexual harassment of some form. Sexual harassment can take many forms. Uh, we'll list four here. Uh, sexual assault mocking innuendo, quid pro quo, or creation of a hostile environment. Sexual assault, of course, is when you're actually assaulted by an individual. They grab you, they handle you. Um, it could result in uh, abuse and rape, but there's a physical altercation. Mocking innuendo, of course, the best way of thinking about this is cat calls from construction workers as women walk by um, the site. Of course, they are not trying to attract those women. They're trying to intimidate those women. Put them in their place. Let them know that they're the macho men. The men wouldn't know what to do with the women if they were to walk back over and start a conversation or give them something back. Of course, quid pro quo is... You scratch my back, I scratch yours. This is what Harvey Weinstein is being accused of. And 
has ultimately brought him and his company down. He would um, essentially make advances on women who were trying to get a job with his company. And he was using sexual favors as the uh, grease to get the wheels moving. And um, so a young woman comes in to get a job. He, as he's interviewing her, um, inappropriately touches or makes advances on her. And then he uses his position of power to say, well, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. This is the way people get parts in Hollywood. And if you do me a favor, I'll do you a favor. And then, of course, if the woman dis disagrees after the inappropriate behaviors um, uh, taken place, then the intimidation comes. And um, the, the, that, that person in the position of power uses that position of power and their wealth and their influence to uh, scare this particular woman into silence. This, this was something that Donald Trump did regularly. He would um, uh, sexually harass somebody, and then when they made statements about it, he would threaten to sue them. He would never follow through on his lawsuits, but the threat of a billionaire suing you um, and the implications of what might come out because of that lawsuit prevented women from saying anything. And then, you know, the overall just creation of a hostile environment where you just allow much of this stuff to go on without it being checked. And in the end, it creates an environment that um, those that are being harassed find very stressful and hard to work in. And of course, this is not just a phenomenon for women. Men can be harmed by sexual harassment too. Some remedies for um, all of these inequalities. Well, of course, we should comply with the 1963 Pay Equity Act. Um, you can't pay different wages to men and women. Adhering to much of what we already have on the books is um, a significant step in the right direction. Uh, gender neutral job comparison systems that measure jobs more fairly than comparative worth programs. So, moving away from some of the traditional ways we've differentiated uh, based on gender and, and coming up with some more systems uh, or some newer systems that are um, gender neutral. Of course, continuing affirmative action policies. Affirmative action has taken some serious hits over the past 10 years. And instead of weakening affirmative action, we should be strengthening it. Eliminate the mommy track. Um, uh, we can do this by adhering to the, dis the Pregnancy Discrimination Act, of course, the, fa the Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993, and then creating family-friendly workplace policies um, uh, that create flexible job environments uh, with flexible work hours, on-site daycare, and parental leave as part of the agreement. And of course, that's going to move us towards equality. Um, despite persistent gender, gender inequality in the workplace, women are there to stay. This is a fact. Women are not going back home. Some of them can't go back home. There's, I mean, I don't mean they can't go back home, but this idea of a man and a woman um, and their two kids and the woman stays at home, it just doesn't fit where we're at these days. Women's work for the same reasons men do to support themselves and their families and to experience a sense of accomplishment, efficacy, and competence in their work. We should all work together to make the workplace more equitable as well as making women's journeys to the workplace easier. Women cannot and should not be treated like second-class citizens any more than anyone else should be. 